everyone, Haley here with Menlo Coaching. Let's talk a little bit of data sufficiency. Now, data sufficiency as a question type often gets kind of a bad rap for being just a weird way to ask about numbers. But it is so much more than that in ways that pose a really serious advantage for the students who take the time to understand its challenges and a pretty serious pitfall for those who don't. And much of that stems from the fact that at its core, data sufficiency is all about resource management. How effectively are we identifying, analyzing and applying the information we've been given, and just as importantly, the information we haven't been given from the start of the question all the way through to its finish. And GMAT authors know how to make this a challenge by presenting that information in some pretty subtle ways. Let's take a look at what I mean. Now for this first example, feel free to pause and work through the example if it looks new to you. Our task is pretty clear. We're asked, what is the value of x? And for most students, upon analyzing statement one, we can pretty quickly see that if x squared over y squared is equal to four over nine, well then x could be equal to two and y could be equal to three since two squared over three squared is again, four over nine. And whether you took a sneak peek from statement two or maybe you were already thinking positive negative number properties, most students will also recognize that we've got the potential for some negative values. I could also have something like negative two over negative three also getting me to four over nine. And for many students, the analysis stops there. They'll say, well, clearly independently, we don't have enough info, but when we put the information together, we can rule out this negative possibility, so we must have sufficiency. There's a little more to it than that. Because while it's absolutely important to recognize the potential for positive negative number properties to come into play, I'd argue it's just as important that we recognize the nature of this four over nine. This is a fraction, a ratio, a scalable relationship that tells us the relationship of x squared to y squared is four to nine. This doesn't inherently tell me x squared is equal to four and that y squared is necessarily equal to nine. In fact, we have infinitely many possibilities that will comply with this relationship. Take four and six, for example. Well, four squared over six squared is equal to 16 over 36, which boils down to give us four over nine. I have infinitely many possibilities that comply with the parameters even when I put my statements together. And I didn't see that by testing every possibility under the sun to disprove sufficiency. I saw that by ensuring that I wasn't letting my guard down after I thought I had already gotten that, aha, I see what they're doing here moment. It's important in data sufficiency that we make sure that we're taking that same level of scrutiny, that same level of attention all the way through the question, even when we think we've already caught the challenge. Now, let's take a look at another example of what I mean. In this next example, right off the bat, hopefully we're recognizing that given the nature of the question stem versus the nature of the statements, there is a step we can take to make our math quite a bit easier here. The question stem asks us, did the phone call last longer than 15 minutes? But our statements are both given in terms of the cost. And it's going to be a lot easier, and probably a little less error prone, to translate my question stem once than it will be to translate my statements twice. So at this point, most students will also recognize that this additional minute tells us that we're not applying that 20 cent charge to all 15 of our minutes when we translate the question stem, but rather to the 12 minutes after those first three have already passed, which means that for a lot of students, their math will look a little something like this. Three times 0.75 plus 12 times 0.2, getting us to $4.65, or the reframed question stem, did the call cost more than $4.65? But did you see what they might've missed here? Yeah, we have 20 cents for each additional minute. But that cost was given to us as 75 cents for the first three minutes. Not each of the first three minutes, not per minute for the first three minutes, but in total for that first three minutes, which means our math should actually look a little more like this. 75 cents plus 12 times 0.2 gives us $3.15, or the question stem, did the call cost more than $3.15? And now we can pretty quickly see that in our statements, well, statement one still gives us both yes answers and no answers in our range. But with statement two, if the cost of the phone call was greater than $3.35, then definitively, yes, the cost was greater than $3.15. And again, I didn't get there by crunching a bunch of numbers or setting up a lot of very intense algebra, but rather by making sure I was reading through the question stem carefully putting the question in the easiest possible terms, and keeping my guard up to take that same level of analysis from the start of the question all the way to its very finish.